Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. Let's wrap up our study of Rimsky-Korsakov's Tutti Chords with two more videos covering the third table from the back of his book, Principles of Orchestration. As some of my viewers might have already noticed, these 20 chords may be organized into three separate tables, but they're actually five sets of four chords, with each set focusing on a different general approach. At the end of my last video, we looked at the first of the set of four wind and brass tutti chords, in other words, with little or no string section involvement. Let's finish off that set now, and then end this video with one of Rimsky-Korsakov's most splendiferous, over-the-top finales of all time. Our first chord from Table 3 is the smallest, most economical chord of all 20 chords. In fact, it really stretches the whole definition of what the words tutti chord might mean. In the case of a very small orchestra, say with only doubled winds and two horns, one could arguably call this a tutti, minus the string section, of course. But however we might classify it, this really is an example of perfectly balanced scoring, with the most optimum register of each instrument utilized so as to achieve a luminous, pearly harmony. Probably the lesson that was intended the most here was in the role of the horns, rooting the F-sharp major chord with this F-sharp octave. Their sonority is what makes the upper winds glow so radiantly, especially in this pianissimo dynamic. Add to this Rimsky-Korsakov's concern that his readers should understand the concept of the enclosure, in which two instruments of one type enclose another instrument or instruments between them. In this case, it's the horns on the root, enclosing the bassoons on the mediant and dominant of the chord. Since the bassoons are able to complement the timbre of other instruments in close proximity, it's almost as if the bottom of the tutti were being played by a quartet of horns, but the subtler timbre of the bassoons results in a smoother, more elegant sound. There are several different approaches to combining two bassoons with two horns to achieve this effect, and this is a very solid example, so long as the dynamic is restrained. Notice that the editor has chosen to make a further point, which doesn't appear in the full score. He wants you to know that the second horn will be playing with a tiny bit more force than the first horn, piano versus pianissimo. This is something you wouldn't need to tell the player either should you score something similar, but the editor, Rimsky-Korsakov's assistant, Maximilian Steinberg, wants you to know that realistically, horns tend to drop off in strength as they drop down by octaves. This is something they'll naturally correct in performance, but especially in a very soft chord like this one, the balance will work better when it's adjusted up by one degree. The rest of the chord is a simple stack consisting of the rest of the winds, clarinets on the next third and fifth of the chord higher, then the oboes playing the next root and mediant on top of that, with the two flutes capping off the final C-sharp and F-sharp above. A subtle point here, by avoiding interlocking or enclosing parts, each lower instrument from below is reinforcing an instrument of a different family above it. So the clarinets form an octave with second flute and first oboe above, while second oboe forms an octave with first flute. The variations in timbre and overtones result in a beautiful mix of colors, even in such a simple chord as this one, especially with the additional overtones arising from the horns and bassoons below. One last little footnote to this chord is that it occurs in two different versions in the opera score. The chord, as quoted in Principles of Orchestration, represents the harmony that Rimsky-Korsakov scored in order to segue from the overture to the first scene of Act I of The Tsar's Bride, from F-sharp major down one step to the tonality of Romanian minor on E. This is also known as Ukrainian Dorian or Altered Dorian. Essentially, Dorian mode with a raised fourth step, in this case, A-sharp.
However, if the overture is performed as a separate concert piece without the opera following it, as is expected for many opera overtures, then Rimsky-Korsakov wants the final chord to settle on D major, staying in the key of the final section of the overture. The next example is really two chords in one, a full-bodied chord in triple winds and two horns, after which the oboe and bassoon family instruments drop out alongside the horns, leaving the flutes and clarinets continuing the chord over a soft rolled timpani on a high F. Let's focus on that first chord, though, because that's where the book is directing our attention. The architecture here is based on three fairly simple voicings, all adding up to a richly scored F major chord. Two stacked 6-3 triads over a widely spaced 10th chord. The top voicing is a fairly straightforward combination, but nonetheless effective. All three flutes, combining with oboes and English horn. The oboes blend beautifully with the flutes here in their upper middle register, while the thinner English horn adds some strength and richness to the third flute by complementing its timbre rather than overwhelming it. Then in the next voicing down, first and second clarinet double third and fourth horn on the same sounding F third, with the third clarinet all by itself on that bottom sounding middle C. You might feel that the horns overbalance the clarinets here in strength, but if the horn players carefully control their dynamic, easily done on those written pitches, then they'll achieve a beautiful blend, filling out the thinner sound of that lowest clarino register written B and that throat tone G. If that happens, then the single third clarinet sitting on the shalomo register written D below will balance quite well. And that single instrument is a great pivot point downwards to the bassoon family instruments taking that bottom voicing on the tenth chord. The proximity of the bassoons to the horns and clarinets above makes the middle of the chord all the more rich and radiant, while the low underpinning F root shows that the contrabassoon doesn't always have to be playing octaves or doubling lower strings in order to be functional. This is the final chord from Rimsky-Korsakov's next-to-last and perhaps greatest opera, The Invisible City of Kitej, about a city that mysteriously disappears when it's under attack by the Tatars. Keeping that entire dramatic arc in mind, the final passage starts triumphantly and then gradually reduces in thickness of texture, finally wisping away at the very end. Staying away from the typical crashing final tutti chord keeps the music fresh, and I'm sure it made the applause all the more heartfelt during its first run of performances. Our next tutti chord takes us back to good old C major, and as you may notice, even at pianissimo once again, the sound picture is starting to expand with the addition of a full quartet of horn, plus heavy brass, timpani, and double basses. While the book doesn't include it, there's also an orchestral bell strike on the root pitch of C, 
and the chord is repeated three times at the end of Act Three of the opera The Christmas Night. As you just heard, an incredibly rich, glowing chord that's very well integrated in timbre, but with more of a brass feel, and yet the upper register has this indescribable quality that only makes sense when you break it down. So let's start up there. Just like the previous chord, the structure is more or less based on stacked 6-3 voicings, but founded on a simple low octave root at the bottom. The top inverted triad combines the flute and clarinet families, but notice how that top C in both cases is covered by the piccolo member of each family, the flauto piccolo and the D clarinet, which would probably be played by an E-flat clarinet these days. This doubling on that top C is turned into tripling by the first oboe, and the result of blending all these different timbres together is what gives Rimsky-Korsakov his soft and yet trumpet-like sound at the top of the chord, the thin brightness of the oboe, the lean but direct sopranino clarinet, and the mellower middle register piccolo. That single note in context is just more proof of the author's genius, if any were needed after the past few videos. The octave that's formed by the second oboe below strengthens and colors the doubled flutes and clarinets in between, and provides a linchpin for the brass scoring below, itself doubling the note of the first trumpet in A. And here we get into the next 6-3 chord voicing, the A trumpets covering C and G, and Rimsky-Korsakov's alto trumpet in F grabbing the E below. That E third is also doubled by first and second horn, mellowing the trumpets, along with the second oboe on the top C. Then jumping down to the lowest 6-3 voicing, we see the trombones covering all three notes, just as the trumpets did above, with just a bit of doubling on the pitch of middle C by first bassoon, which helps to stabilize that note, and also mellow it a bit to match the blended sounds of the pitches above. All that's left is the foundational C octave below all these inverted triads, with 2nd bassoon, 3rd and 4th horn, and rolled timpani on top, and tuba plus double basses below. Putting it all back together again, it's a wonderfully integrated sound, so expertly balanced and combined as to present a unified timbre throughout. Our last example for this video represents the first of the final set of tutti chords. The category including chorus and solo voices, and even piano and harp on a couple of chords. Here's an example of the piano used simply as another ensemble instrument, which emerged around this time as a feature of both Russian and American orchestral music. But before we get too deep into the piano's role here, Let's have a listen to this chord, which is repeated three times at the end of Rimsky-Korsakov's opera The Snow Maiden. A phenomenally huge finale chord, as you can hear. With quite different architecture than the previous chords with their stacked 6-3 voicings. In any chord such as this, the composer's first duty is ensuring that the choir and soloists are well supported by the orchestra. So let's break down the vocal scoring first. In the full score, Rimsky-Korsakov has grouped all the soloists together with the choir, so we don't have to separate parts out here in the diagram. It's simple enough to note that all soprano voices hit that top B-flat. The altos cover the B-flat triad below that, 
and the tenors and basses sing the next B-flat triad down. At this volume, the singers simply need bright, triumphant support in complementary orchestral colors, rather than any kind of contrast or tension. This is supplied to the sopranos and altos by interlocking tremolo first and second violins, flutes plus doubled oboes and clarinets in the winds, trumpets further tripling those oboe and clarinet pitches, with a four horn supplying the root, The overtones from the huge B-flat horn unison is all the sopranos need in order to hear where to slot their top note. If a high trumpet sounding that same high B-flat had been added here, it would take away from their quality of tone. In the recording, you can hear that lead solo soprano singing the loudest, clearest note in the whole sound picture. So it's sufficient for the tripling of trumpets, oboes, and clarinets to support and brighten the chord, along with the altos, on that sounding D third. As to the tenor and bass voices, a simple B flat major triad in the trombones provides all the backing they need to really push from below. The first bassoon and tremolo violas will add a tiny bit of color if they're heard at all, which isn't too likely doubling triple forte trombones but better to put them in than leave them out, at least in the context of this late Romantic era scoring. That just leaves the octave B-flat notes above and below this central splash of forceful color. Second bassoon, tuba, rolled timpani, and tremolo cellos on the next B-flat down. And on the lowest root tone, basses furiously tremolo away all by themselves. Five octaves higher. The piccolo flutters away on a B-flat trill, supported in energy by the flutes trilling an octave below, and the piano playing a spread-out octave trill. Then the icing on the cake is provided by sweeps across the whole sound picture by harp. The dynamic is so incredibly loud here that an additional harp wouldn't be excessive. The finale of the Snow Maiden opera is really quite phenomenal, with its mighty build-up to the blazing last chord, all starting a few pages before with an unaccompanied contralto solo in 11-4 time, the melody of which is taken up by the choir with simple octave doubling by winds, trombones, and strings, then scored as a chorale in the solo voices with double reeds supporting along with strummed chords and piano and harp. The urgent gestures that follow push the music ever more forcefully toward a feverish climax, which gets more and more intense all the way up to the chord we just analyzed. Let's have a listen to all that now. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 
It's been really enjoyable analyzing these chords for you as part of my updating of Rimsky-Korsakov's Principles of Orchestration. Patreon supporters can jump over to my page to read some of my latest annotations of the text, and I'll be sharing the last video of Tutti Chords here on the channel very soon, along with some extensive excerpts straight from the pages of the book. Everybody stand by, more great content from Principles of Orchestration coming soon. Thank you.